I am Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. This is Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. Ukraine's government has accused Russia of war crimes for deliberately targeting civilians during its invasion of Ukraine. New satellite photos show a massive 40-mile convo of Russian tanks and armored vehicles stretching from the Russian border to the outskirts of Ukraine's capital, Kiev. Ukrainian officials say troops from Belarus have joined Russia's invasion. As we continue to look at the invasion of Ukraine, we're joined by two guests, Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University, permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, author of many books, including The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, and recently Our Malady, Lessons in Liberty from a Hospital Diary. We're also joined by Andrew Coburn, the Washington editor for Harper's Magazine. His book, just out, is called The Spoils of War. Power, Profit, and the American War Machine. Andrew Coburn, let's begin with you. If you can start off by responding to the latest news, this Russian convoy of 40 miles um, coming closer and closer to Kiev, Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv, has been bombed, uh, the local municipal building, as well as other sites, uh, the massive um, uh, departure of Ukrainians fleeing a war, uh, half a million Ukrainians, massively women and children, going to Poland, Romania and other places. Can you comment on what's happening today? Yes, uh, well, the, <clears throat> it looks like you know we hear a lot about how the you know the Russian offensive has you know slowed down, been you know ground to a halt, or is being you know met up unexpected resistance, which uh, you know is true. On the other hand, they do seem to be moving fairly steadily in a sort of a slightly creaky way towards their objectives. I mean, they've surrounded the uh, uh, Kharkov and uh, uh, Kiev. Um, They've moved, they've done, you know, their separatist forces are presumably reinforced by regular Russian troops, have done quite well in the east, have advanced out, have taken most of the Donetsk and Luhansk provinces. Um, the forces coming out of Crimea are, you know, advancing, uh, it seems, fairly successfully. Um, they've got Mariupol surrounded, which they regard as a sort of heartland of. Uh, of what they call neo-Nazi, you know, the Azov Battalion, uh, you know, the extreme rightist elements that this, from Putin's point of view, this whole war is meant to be about. So, um, you know, I would think that they've, uh, you know, the, the Russians, in a sort of slightly warped way, may be quite pleased with, or the Russian high command, may be quite pleased with the way things are going. Um, yes, of course, I mean, it's, you know, the horrible tragedy of the... Uh, you know, all these refugees, I mean, <clears throat> and as I'm glad you pointed out, in sharp contrast to the way uh, people from the Middle East and, you know, non-white or whatever, non-European refugees have been treated by the, uh, by the Poles and the EU generally. Um, it's in been interesting what Yuri uh, Shalyazenko just said, of course, I mean, that, that, uh, that does not include people from the refugees, don't seem to include people from Kiev, because, you know, the way is blocked. The Russians have, you know, occupied the, as I say, they've encircled the city. Uh, so the people from, from Kiev, the people really under threat, can't get out. Uh, and there's been no, apparently, no negotiation or certainly no successful negotiation on a humanitarian corridor. I mean, the... Um, it's curious. I mean, it's hard. This is such a fog of war that uh, there's, there's so much misinformation flying around. Um, I mean, it's interesting whether or not the Russians really have achieved uh, air superiority in Ukraine. I mean, one of the interesting things and maybe one of the disappointments from the Russian point of view is that the uh, Russian Air Force um, hasn't really been present or hasn't really been successful in the way you might have thought from all the sort of threat inflation we've heard in recent years about uh, how Russia's become a mighty power. I mean, I think they, you know, obviously they've been fighting in Syria. The Air Force certainly has for the last few years, so that's probably put a strain on them. I've heard that they're running out of precision-guided munitions, which may be a problem. But generally, 
I mean, given the disastrous calculation, in my view, and heinous calculation by Putin to go ahead with this, I would say they may think they're not doing too badly. And uh, uh, Alexander, I, I wanted to ask you about that in terms of the um, uh, the media is portraying this as the Russian army already bogged down five days uh, into this war. Uh, but I, I look back at the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, in 2003, yeah. which started on March 20th, and it took until April 9th. Uh, it took a, a three weeks for the U.S. military against a far less powerful army in Iraq uh, to reach Baghdad. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the war was uh, initiated by a week of massive bombardment of of Iraqi uh, cities and uh, and of the military, the Iraqi military to basically decimate the military before the troops started moving. In in uh, in retrospect, and I completely agree with you that this was a a, a crazy and and fundamentally uh, uh, unjust invasion. But on the other hand, it seems that uh, Russia has not sought this kind of shock and awe approach to just bomb the cities and and uh, and uh, instead it's chosen to send its armies in and to try to capture the cities in a methodical way almost as a some experts have said that they're seeking they understand that if there's massive casualties among the Ukrainian people that will be not uh, 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 not looked upon kindly even by the Russian population Right, you know, and it would be a, a hundred years war. No, I'm quite I'm really glad you you point that out. I mean, as you say, it took three weeks for the uh, U.S. and British to reach uh, Baghdad, and you know, most of the time they were advancing across desert. So, um, but this looks like a sort of <clears throat> really like a lightning blitzkrieg in in comparison. And and obviously, it's also correct as you say that the. Russians, Putin didn't really, you know, has, didn't want to sort of permanently alienate the uh, Ukrainian population. I mean, it seems fairly clear that he's, you know, united them, or <clears throat> certainly united a huge proportion of them now in opposition uh, to to the to Russia in a way that may not have, may not have been the case a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's been, you know, I'd like to, <clears throat> I've been thinking where. One on you know CNN or something with one of these old hacks from the Pentagon who are they're wheeling on to comment and cheer on the uh, cheer on our side in Ukraine. I'd like to ask them how they would have invaded Ukraine. I mean, and as you say, it's fairly clear what would have happened. It would have been massive destruction. Started with massive destruction of infrastructure, as happened in the two Iraq wars that uh, we were engaged in, and. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, bombing water treatment plants and power stations and communications and all the rest that's you know, become the traditional U.S. way of war. So you know, I'm mean, glad that the Russians at least haven't so far gone in for that. Uh, that may change, but uh, um, you know, <laughs> there is a sharp contrast, and you know, none of which, very little of which, gets mentioned in the. Uh, the official media, because uh, it's open season on hypocrisy. And Andrew Coburn, could you talk about the sanctions in place uh, that the, the West uh, is exacting on Russia, the impact it will have uh, not only on Russia, but clearly on especially uh, Western Europe? Well, exactly. Um, you know, it's, you know, we've gone used to sanctions has become really the premier U.S. and uh, Foreign policy tool of uh, you know we've been sanctioned you know Cuba for <clears throat> decades or half a century we sanctioned Iraq sanctioned Iran uh, sanctioned Syria and we got used to it's a great way to beat up you know small comparatively powerless countries who have little really input and impact on the global economy now if they didn't think about it before they're certainly realizing that. Um, you know, first of all, I should say quickly, obviously, it's having disastrous effects on the Russian economy. But it's very interesting. I mean, car comp car factories in Germany are already closing down because they can't get parts that have turned out to be sourced from uh, from Russia and indeed Ukraine. Um, it turns out, you know, a lot of people are discovering for the first time that uh, Russia and Ukraine between them supply a third of the world's wheat supply. Um, uh, wheat production. 
um, which is you know what a lot of the Middle East eats, uh, Iraq, um, uh, Egypt particularly. I mean, you're going to see if the price of bread can't be controlled there. You're going to see, I think, great sort of dissension and riots there. Um, semiconductors, you know, can't be made here without a su supplies of various sort of ingredients most of us have never heard of that come from Russia. So in a way, now that it's all out economic warfare, we're finding that it's um, there's a lot of pushback, a, a lot of payback in a, in a sense, and in a way we've sanctioned ourselves as well. I want to bring Timothy Snyder into the conversation, Yale historian, author of many books, including The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, and On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Your response to the latest developments right now? Well, so we, we, we know what Russia's initial war plan was. It was premised on Mr. Putin's assumption that Ukrainians and Russians are really one people. So if he can simply send in a strike force to surround the Ukrainian capital and physically eliminate the Ukrainian government, then everyone will go over to the Russian side. We know that because it's consistent with the initial attack plan. We also know it because they accidentally published these documents a couple of days ago. So. When we want to look at um, what's happening, I think we have to distinguish stage one, which was a failure thanks to unexpectedly strong and intelligent um, Ukrainian resistance, resistance on the part of people who are essentially defending their homes, um, by the way, also from attacks on water supply, energy supply, apartment buildings, and everything which was listed already. All of those things have already been attacked, including cities. But so in stage one, um, the Russian plan fails because of Ukrainian resistance, but also because of, of its nature. Now we're moving to stage two, which will include precisely the things which were described before. We're moving towards more like a Grozny scenario or a Syria scenario where the Russians will do what the Russians do in their doctrine. They besiege cities and then they pound them from the outside and with air power until the civilians um, force the leadership to capitulate. So unless these columns can be somehow stopped or we can get to some kind of negotiated solution by way of pressure on Russia, we're going to see a much more horrifying stage of this war follow. And uh, uh, Professor Snyder, can you talk about uh, uh, about the uh You've mentioned Putin's belief that Ukraine and Russia are part of one nation. Uh, can you d describe uh, your uh, your view of the historical truth here? Well, it's. I mean, I guess I would say even if Mr. Putin were a historian, it's not the job of a historian to say who belongs to what nation. You know, it's not. It's not my job to tell people, you know, in Africa what nations they belong to or Canadians, whether they belong to a nation or not. A nation is a group of people with a common sense about what the future holds and what they should be doing. And in that sense, Ukrainians are indisputably a nation. The history, I mean, since you ask, is just unbelievably wrong um, and abusive. The idea that because a Viking baptized himself uh, a thousand years ago, maybe, therefore Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia are one nation is palpably absurd. The idea that the Bolsheviks created Ukraine, as Mr. As, as, as Mr. Putin claims, is also ridiculous. It's the other way around. The Soviet Union was created as a union, as a federation with national names, precisely because a hundred years ago, even the far left in Russia was perfectly aware that Ukraine was a nation and had to be accommodated in some way. And this language, by the way, this language that other people are not states, that other people are not nations, that is the language of destroying the state and of destroying the nation. That's the, that's the logic that follows. And since we're on the topic, another of Mr. Putin's historical claims or abuses of historical language is the idea that he's carrying out a denazification campaign, when in fact what his army is doing is set up to do is to destroy a government which is which is led by a democratically elected Jewish president. He's abusing the historical legacy that we have, and he's abusing our ability to use history to try to make some kind of judgment on what's happening now. We're going to break, then come back to this conversation. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue to look at Russia's invasion of Europe. I want to turn back to a comment on Democracy Now! in 2014, made by the late historian Stephen Cohen, about how NATO expansion in Eastern Europe could lead to war. 
When we took in, we meaning the United States and NATO, all these countries in Eastern Europe into NATO, we did not, we agreed with the Russians we would not put forward military installations there. We built some infrastructure, airstrips, there's some barracks, stuff like that. But we didn't station troops that could march toward Russia there. Now what NATO is saying, it is time to do that. Now, Russia already felt encircled by NATO member states on its borders. The Baltics are on its borders. Uh, if we move the forces, NATO forces, including American troops, uh, to, toward Russia's borders, uh, where will we be then? I mean, it's obviously going to militarize the situation and therefore raise the danger of war. And I think it's important to emphasize, though I regret saying this, Russia will not back off. This is existential. That's historian Stephen Cohen, the late historian, speaking in 2014 on Democracy Now! We're speaking now with Andrew Coburn, Harper's Magazine, Washington editor, in his new book, The Spoils of War, Power, Profit, and the American War Machine, and Yale University professor of history, Timothy Snyder, author of On Tyranny and the Road to Unfreedom. Andrew Coburn, can you respond to this, and then we'll get the response of Professor Snyder? Well, um... Steve Cohen, you know, he, he was exactly right. I mean, you know, what he said would happen has happened. Um, so I don't know, we hardly need to argue about it. I mean, it was, I mean, there's many, I'm sure that the whole story of NATO expansion will become in, further encrusted with myth, but it is certainly the case that, um, that we did, you know, there were, were promises made to, uh, to Gorbachev and the then Soviet leadership at the time of the German unification, reunification, uh, at the end of the Cold War, that NATO would not expand beyond beyond Germany. I mean, the, the Russians sort of agreed that the uh, uh, that you know that all of Germany would be in NATO, but they did say they wouldn't they wouldn't expand further. Um, and for some reason, the uh, the Soviets agree, you know believed them that when they didn't have much option, of course. Um, so, you know, there has been then the further expansion of the, you know, there was in Poland, the first tranche was in, came in 99 and then in 2004, and the Russians complained continually. And then it came up again in, you know, 2007, 8, when there was talk at that point of Ukraine and Georgia joining. And at that point uh, in 2008, remember, now we hear you know, it's glibly said, and then Russia invaded Georgia. Well, actually, yes, they did, but that was that was uh, preceded by a very deliberate provocation or initiative by the Georgian leader Shakashvili to uh, move into what was a sort of Russian, whatever you want to call it, protectorate or uh, South Ossetia, with the aim. And I know this from having talked to a lot of the people in the. Uh, who were involved uh, both in Georgia and uh, in Washington at the time, with the aim, as one of them said, uh, of flipping Misha Shakashvili wanted to flip us into a war. And actually, at that point, the Bush, uh, Bush himself and Condoleezza Rice and Stephen Hadley, the national security advisor, went to some lengths to tamp that down, to tell Shakashvili they were not going to intervene on his behalf, not going to support him in his efforts, in Bush's words, to start World War Three, so you know there has been, you know it's you know again pre we have to prefigure this by proceed. We have to say, of course, what Putin does, has done is absolutely disgraceful. But it's kind of easy to understand there has been sustained efforts to push NATO forward to um, to appear in a what to Russians might seem like Russian leadership might seem like a threatening posture, and to. Um, you know, people say there's a saying that NATO exists to deal with the instability that its own uh, existence uh, yeah. creates. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if Timothy Snyder can respond to this issue of uh, the NATO expansion. But also, you know, I happen to be uh, unfortunately old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, when President Kennedy was ready to go to war if necessary with uh, uh, the Soviet Union over the fact that the Soviet Union was putting missiles in an independent country, Cuba, uh, but was uh, but uh, the United States felt threatened uh, by the ability of the Soviet Union to enter its sphere of influence. I'm wondering if there's you see any parallels 
with uh, the mentality of uh, Putin right now? So let me let me just let me roll back to the history and I'll end with I'll end with Cuba. So there when 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 Germany was unified, um, the, the, the Americans and the Soviets uh, did make an arrangement about West Germany and East Germany. That arrangement, however, did not foresee and had nothing to do with the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union. After 19, we're talking about something that happened in 1990. In 1991, to everyone's surprise, the Soviet Union no longer existed. And after that point, it's very important to remember that the world isn't just about Washington and Moscow. It's also about other sovereign states and other peoples who can express their desires and have their own foreign policies. So when we speak of NATO enlargement, I mean, that's a bit of a misnomer. NATO was not there to enlarge. There wasn't much willingness on the part of Western Europe or the US to enlarge. It was the East Europeans themselves who pushed the process forward. I mean, we can decide that they didn't understand their own national interests, but that's how the process unfolded. It came from the East Europeans. And there was never an understanding between the United States and Russia after 1991, that this wasn't going to happen. It's true that the Russians objected, but it's also true that their understanding of NATO has changed drastically after NATO expansion halted um, and with the re-election of Mr. Putin. In the 1990s and 2000s, Russia and NATO cooperated, not least in Afghanistan, where the Russians tended to insist that the Americans and NATO had to take a harder line than they were taking. Mr. Putin himself referred to NATO well into the 21st century as a defensive alliance. He himself has changed drastically the way that he speaks about NATO. He uses it essentially as a way to try to rally the Russian population. Now, I would distinguish between what Mr. Putin says about this war and what the Russians think. It's very hard to find, at least as far as I can read the data, a Russian opinion that somehow Russia was threatened by Ukraine in 2022. I'm not, I'm not seeing that. But in an important and fundamental way, this entire discussion is moot because now we know, given the way that the Russians are prosecuting this war, that it never had anything to do with the ostensible motivations that they cited in late 2021. Given the way that they're prosecuting this war, we know that it's about the destruction of the Ukrainian state, given what they say and what they're doing. So um, I think it's important to also give the Russians agency to give Mr. Putin agency um, to understand that he might have motives which go beyond things that we do or go beyond the things he says that he th thinks Seconds. we'll understand. Now, on Cuba, Cuba encourages me in an odd way, because in Cuba, the Americans made a deal. We pulled our missiles out of Turkey. That was the deal. I think there are arrangements that can be made to stop this war. I think there are compromises that can be found. We want to thank you both for being with us. Uh, clearly, a discussion that we need to continue at a future date. Timothy Snyder, Yale professor of history, author of many books, including The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, and on Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. And thank you to Andrew Coburn, Washington editor of Harper's Magazine, his new book, The Spoils of War, Power, Profit, and the American War Machine. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.